I did get a last, uh, a late question just a few minutes ago. Thought I would share this one with you. Ask and you shall receive. May I have a free autographed copy of the book that comes from these lectures? <laughs> Perhaps you might show grace toward my hermeneutical approach to the above verse. <laughs> uh, first comment, uh, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> uh, free copy, grace. Would you settle for my face shining upon you? <laughs> I do have some others from yesterday. Is new tradition possible given the diversity of current Christianity? Um, in my family, when my children were young, every time we did something once that they liked, it became a tradition. <laughs> Scripture, of course, is sufficient, um, but our grasp of it is not. That's why we need theology and reflection and a community thinking about it. So I do think that though Scripture is sufficient and that everything that we need is already there, it still needs to be mined. And as John Robinson said, there's more light to come from God's world, word, so I think there's more gold to be mined. And sometimes we only get to the gold when there's a presenting problem, a controversy in the church, and we're forced to think, some, or forced to think uh, through something harder than we've ever thought before. That happened in Nicaea with regard to the status of the son's divinity. And it's happened throughout church history. And who knows, maybe in the 20th century, people will look back and they'll see uh, the doctrine of inerrancy. as having been there, but not made explicit until the mid 20th century when certain problems were raised. So I think tradition grows only because the conversation grows and our understanding expands. Then uh, another question, oh, I, I mentioned in passing that uh, Sola Scriptura is the story of my life and uh, could I further explain this? And I'll just take a, a, a couple of minutes, less than a minute maybe, to do this if I do it quickly. I did my thesis in seminary on the question of biblical authority. And what I discovered was any or every Christian theologian wants to claim the authority of scripture in some way. So everybody wants to be biblical. I also discovered that having a high doctrine of scripture is not enough to guarantee good practice. And I have to say that was an aha moment for me. I think I had thought up until then, if I had the right doctrine of scripture, all would be well. But scripture must be used. We have to practice it, and we need a high practice of scripture to accompany a high doctrine. Uh, I've also learned that we need to preserve the distinction between an inerrant or infallible text and errant and fallible interpretations. Having a high doctrine of scripture unfortunately does not guarantee that your interpretations will be infallible. So that's something that I've learned and wrestled with. I've also learned, I think, that being biblical is ultimately a matter of letting scripture rule, not only in one's thought, but in, in one's living. And that's why I've come to see scripture as a script in a couple of senses, a theatrical script that demands to be performed because Jesus says, if you hear my words and don't do them, you're like the foolish man who builds his house upon sand. These words have to be done. It's a script to be performed. And then there's also the pharmaceutical sense of script, which is my father was a chemist, a pharmacist, and he always talked about a prescription as a script. Well, again, that script as well is useless unless you take the medicine, unless you take the prescription. So we have to do something with scripture. It calls for our obedience if we're going to walk as children of light in its light. So all these factors, I think I've been learning over the years about what it means to be biblical, and it's a much more demanding task than I had thought in the early days when I thought it was simply a theoretical question. That's why it's this literally the story of my life. Will I respond to God's word with faithfulness and obedience in a way that, that glorifies and magnifies it? Okay, Solus Christus. Number 62 of Luther's 95 Theses reads, the true treasure of the church 
is the most holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. The gospel lies at the heart of the church, and the Lord Jesus Christ is at the head of the church. Those who cherish the gospel must cherish the church, for the church is an implication of the gospel. Maybe even it's telos. The church gives body, you see, to the lordship of Christ. Solus Christus affirms Christ as the only mediator between God and humanity, but it doesn't mean Christ alone independent of the church. Calvin refers to the visible church as the mother of all believers, and though Christ becomes ours through faith, Calvin says we need outward helps to beget and increase faith within us. The risen Christ has accommodated himself to our weakness in the economy of redemption. And as we just heard from Ephesians, he's given us gifts, evangelists, prophets, pastor teachers. And these are all ministers of the church. So the burden of this lecture is to show that mere Protestant Christianity ought to treasure the church because it treasures the gospel. We're also going to see that Christ authorizes a royal priesthood of believers to proclaim the gospel, yes, but as I was saying about the script, also to put hands and feet to the gospel, to embody the gospel. I therefore propose to treat Solus Christus in connection with Corpus Christi, the body of believers, in the midst of which the risen Christ exercises his rule on earth as it is in heaven. So in one sense, the royal priesthood of believers is a high point of these lectures, not, well, not only because it's answering the charge about interpretive anarchy, but also because it in a, is in a sense the culmination of a positive statement of the gospel. So the aim of this lecture is a mere Protestant ecclesiology, by which I mean an ecclesiology that affirms the church's unity in diversity. Calvin says the church is called Catholic, which means universal, because there could not be two or three churches unless Christ be torn asunder, which cannot happen, he writes. Catholicity was a major concern of the Reformation. Medieval Christendom had surrendered the notion of Catholicity to a limited understanding of the faith. And the reformers were trying to retrieve not only the evangel, but the universality of the faith. They were trying to be true Catholics. So in the context of the Reformation, solus Christus, Christ alone, like sola gratia and sola fide, expresses the Protestant conviction that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, that there is only one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2.5. Again, at first glance, that seems to exclude the necessity of the church and the priestly class. But on closer inspection, I think we'll see that Solus Christus does not negate the priestly office, but relocates and redefines it. The solas, insofar as they lift up Christ, the gospel, and his kingdom, imply the royal priesthood of all believers, which is the place where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Solus Christus is a good summary of theology's first principles and first love. I'm now on A1. The gospel is essentially the announcement, the setting forth in speech, of what is in Jesus Christ. So nothing I'm going to say this morning is intended in any way to detract or distract us from the gospel. Indeed, I've recently taken to defining Christian theology as the conceptual indication or setting forth of what is in Jesus Christ. In philosophy, metaphysics is the study of what is, reality. But theology focuses on ultimate reality and defines reality in terms of what is in Christ. So nothing I'm saying is 
detracting from the centrality of Christ. And what is in Christ is a capacious notion. In Christ, there is not only perfect humanity, Hebrews 4.15, but also the whole fullness of deity dwelling bodily, Colossians 2.9. In Christ, there is perfect humanity, perfect deity. In Christ, there are Trinitarian relationships, the unbroken love of the Father for the Son in the Spirit. In Christ, there is the last Adam who recapitulates and puts history uh, back where it should be, the history of obedience. In Christ, there's the obedient son that Israel never managed to be. In Christ, there is salvation, reconciliation, and every spiritual blessing. Do you see how much there is in Christ? Everything real is in Christ. And theology is the joyful science of describing the reality that is in Christ. What is in Christ also refers to his work as mediator of a new covenant. Christ takes up the offices that structured ancient Israelite society, prophet, priest, and king. Christ, as you know, is Greek for Messiah or anointed one. And this signals Jesus' mediatorial role. What in the Old Testament were distinct offices become aspects of Christ's unified mediatorial work. Solus Christus means that we need no further prophets to deliver God's word, no more priests to make propitiation and mediate salvation, no more kings to rule. What is in Christ is ours by grace through faith. And to be in Christ is to be restored to true humanity so that we may once more rightly image God. Union with Christ is of all world words the best that can be heard because union with Christ means that we are elect, justified, sanctified, and adopted. It means that we share in all the benefits of his sonship particularly the incomparable privilege of calling God Father. But there's more. Union with Christ means union with others who are in Christ too. What is in Christ is not only a set of isolated individuals, but a new humanity, a company of communicants, a communion of saints. What is in Christ is the church. Point B, Calvin calls the church the society of Christ. And this may be enough to justify my decision to link ecclesiology to solus Christus. There's no one agreed doctrine of the church among Protestants, but mere Protestants agree that the church is a creature of the gospel, a gathering where God's word is proclaimed in word and sacrament, and that such gatherings are apostolic. So I want now to distinguish mere Protestant ecclesiology from three other ways of relating Christ to the church. The first one is the Roman Catholic way under the heading totus Christus. That's Latin for the whole Christ. And the Roman Catholic teaching is that Christ includes both the head and the body. Now, if you carry that to its logical conclusion, it implies that the visible church, in this case, the institutional Roman Catholic Church, is a continuation of Christ's incarnation. Protestants beg to differ. First, because Jesus was impeccable, and the church, sadly, is not. Second, because Jesus' sacrificial offering was definitive and once for all. And there's nothing further the church can do to secure grace. Jesus said, it is finished. We don't need more sacri propitiatory sacrifices. Third, the ascension means that Christ, in one sense, is not here, which is why the church is a fellowship in Christ in the Holy Spirit. It's been said the church is risen ri with Christ, but the church is not risen as Christ. So the problem with totus Christus is that it conflates Christ and the church. 
That's one extreme. Point two, another extreme. Not every community that gathers does so to hear the gospel. And there's a noteworthy trend in our time called the godless congregation. The creed of the humanist community at Harvard University is, I believe in community. And this community at Harvard and others like it meet on Sunday mornings. They gather to do what? Talk about community, do community. And this kind of meeting is geared toward that part of the population that responds to surveys about religion and religious affiliation by ticking none. Godless congregations minister to the nuns, that is N-O-N-E-S. <laughs> they outwardly resemble Christian churches, but they're trying to do community and achieve communion apart from Christ. Such communities force the church to think more carefully about its own nature, identity, and mission. And one important difference between the church and a godless congregation is that the church doesn't have to achieve community. It simply bears witness to what is in Christ. There's already reconciliation in Christ. And Bonhoeffer says this beautifully in Life Together. Quote, Christian community is not an ideal we have to realize, but a reality created by God in which we participate. That's the difference between the church and a Christless congregation. But then three, there's also something we might call the congregationalist Christ. You see, some people might read solus Christus as meaning that all a person needs to be a good Christian is a relationship to Jesus Christ. Christ alone, the individual alone. They might ask the question, how important is church, really? Now, the reformers certainly displayed a certain kind of anti-clericalism, but some of their evangelical descendants manifest an outright anti-ecclesial prejudice. One observer of the North American scene sees a parallel between the nuns, that is, those who have no religious affiliation, and the nons, those who have no particular denominational affiliation. In contrast to this ecclesial thin gruel, mere Protestant Christianity views the church as essential because it is the theater of evangelical operations. It's where we see the grace of God worked out between people the way it's supposed to. And after all, the central plot in scripture has to do with God forming a holy nation, not a holy person. God wants to bring a people under his rule in his place. And this leads me then to the constructive part, recovering in Christ alone and the royal priesthood, point C. Israel was the first holy nation set apart by God to be his treasured possession. God explains the purpose for which he brought Israel out of Egypt in an important passage, uh, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The reformers latched on to this phrase and waved it in the face of the Roman Catholic idea that believers needed a priestly caste that would mediate grace to them and interpret scripture for them. Now, in my introductory lecture, I called the priesthood of all believers the final principle of mere Protestant Christianity, that is, the end or the purpose of salvation history. However, the principle of the priesthood of all believers was misunderstood uh, early on in the Reformation and mutated into an idea that did appear to license interpretive anarchy. So is the royal priesthood of all believers simply a pious way of speaking about the interpretive authority of individuals? Is that what it is? <laughs> 
Where does the royal priesthood fit in the economy of interpretive authority? Well, I think the decisive clue or a clue is the adjective royal. There is an institutional aspect to the church, an ordered distribution of the authority that belongs to Christ alone. Remember, we've talked about that economy, the ordering, how, how Christ administers his authority. I want then to unfold the concept of the royal priesthood of all believers by asking three questions. Who are the church's priests? What do they do? And why is the priesthood royal? So first, who are the church's priests? In the Old Testament, the priest was set apart for the service of God, especially in the tabernacle and temple, and uh, set apart to maintain the people's holiness before God, not least by teaching God's people God's law. In Deuteronomy 33.10, we read, They, the priests, shall teach Jacob your rules and Israel your law. Strikingly, though, the word priest is never used in the New Testament of individual believers or the church's ministers. It is applied to Christ, of course, who Hebrews identifies as a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 6.20. Now, Melchizedek was himself a priest king, as the name hints, and he was also the first priest to be mentioned in Scripture. Genesis 14, verse 17. Now, Christ alone mediates salvation, and yet Peter picks up this language from Exodus 19 and applies it to the church. 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, and compare that to Revelation 5, 1, which also uses the language of kingdom and priests. So is there a discrepancy here? Christ the only priest, and yet the church is a priesthood? Calvin helps to resolve the apparent contradiction. He says, only Christ's sacrifice reconciles the world, world to God, yet, and I quote Calvin here, in him, in Christ, we are all priests, but to offer praises and thanksgivings, in short, to offer ourselves and ours to God. In him, we are all priests. The royal priesthood is in Christ. The, royal, uh, the universal priesthood of all believers was at the heart of Luther's reform. Some have said that this concept is nothing less than a paraphrase of the Reformation concept of the church. As a slogan, however, as I've indicated, it's, it's open to misunderstanding. And some people appeal to the priesthood of every believer to minimize the role of pastors and teachers on the grounds that every person is his or her own priest. For example, in my country, Alexander Campbell appealed to the universal priesthood to justify his no creed but the Bible stance and no interpretive authority but me stance. Now, Luther intended the priesthood of all believers as an alternative to the Roman Catholic assumption that the clergy represented a superior spiritual class of people, superior to the laity. And that was the first wall protecting the papacy to which Luther laid siege in his appeal to the Christian nobility of the German nations. And in that treatise, Luther says this, all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate for baptism, gospel, and faith alone make us spiritual and a Christian people, and we are all consecrated priests through baptism. Now, the important point not to be missed is that Luther never spoke of the priesthood of the believer in the singular, and neither does the New Testament. The reformers emphasize the priesthood of all believers that is not as a isolated, or not as a set of isolated individuals, but the set of gathered individuals. It has a corporate reference. It's not a charter for rank individualism. It actually means the opposite. Luther says, every man is priest to every other man. In other words, it doesn't 
le uh, legitimate individuality, it calls for community. We're to be priests to one another in the gathered community. So far from upholding the right of private judgment, the priesthood of all believers refers to the freedom and responsibility of every Christian to be a Christ to one's neighbor. And that leads me to what do, what do priests do? Uh, taking Christ the high priest as our paradigm, we can say that as fully human, he represents humanity before God, and as fully divine, he represents God to humanity. His once-for-all sacrifice suffices for the forgiveness of sins. But we can function as priests when we proclaim that finished work. The proclamation of the word, which is at the heart of the church, belongs to the church as a whole and to each member individually. And that's our priesthood, to proclaim the finished work of Christ. Luther was fond of citing Malachi 2.7, to show that the principal task of Old Testament priests was to teach people the law of God. All believers are priests then, responsible for teaching, sharing, and doing the word of God. Luther says, we stand before God and intercede for one another. We proclaim God's word to one another. It's a very important point. Um, the congregation can't just watch the pastor talk about God. To be a member of the royal priesthood of believers is to have a mandate to minister Christ to others in words and deed. Paul says we're to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Peter says the function of the royal priesthood is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is 1 Peter 2.9. So this conception of the priesthood of all believers that we're all priests for one another also goes a long way toward explaining the rise in the prominence of certain distinct Protestant forms of communication. And the most conspicuous example is vernacular translation. This was a priestly priority for Luther to make the Bible available to the laity by translating it into languages they could speak. Sermons are another example. In Protestant churches, the pulpit becomes the visual focal point. The priesthood is ministering the word. Lastly, commentaries proliferated after the Reformation, and they too serve as aids to understanding and exposition. So it's all about ministering the word to one another. But why is the priesthood royal, point C? Luther never really does anything with this adjective, as far as I can make out. But as I've also said, retrieving involves more than simply repeating. A doctoral dissertation by a Wheaton student, Uche Anazor, called Kings and Priests, is published. You're welcome, Uche. Uh, Kings and Priests retrieves this idea of the royal priesthood in order to give biblical theological support to the uh, recent efforts in theological interpretation of scripture. And what he does in his thesis is that he argues that scripture itself, more than hermeneutics or literary theory, gives us the key categories to think about what readers are and what readers do. And those categories that he explores in his book are kings and priests. Priests, he says, function as the paradigm for didactic reading teaching the law, but also how to apply it, how to distinguish the sacred from the profane, judging difficult civil cases, learning discernment. That's what the priests help us to see readers do. And then as to the royal qualifier, Anazor says that the Old Testament kings were to be exemplars of wise and virtuous reading practices. He says, chief among the characteristics of the ideal reader where the fear of God, humility, delight in the word, dependence on Yahweh, and the response of obedience. Another book by Oliver O'Donovan, The Desire of Nations, provides further help, I think, in understanding why the priesthood is called royal. O'Donovan says the church is the community that lives under the authority of him 
to whom God has entrusted the kingdom. He sees the church as a political society in this sense. It's ruled and authorized by the ascended Christ alone. Paul says in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. In Christ, the church is now authorized to represent Israel and the people of the kingdom of God on earth. So the church is that kind of a political community. Augustine called the church the polis or the city of God. Jonathan Lehman, uh, part of the uh, Mark Deaver Nine Marks organization, has written a book for a series I'm editing. So I took this, you're getting a pre-publication preview of, well, I guess the core of his book. Sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Lehman calls the church an embassy of Christ's kingdom. Now, the terminology is a little bit different, but the point is the same as O'Donovan's. The church is not a voluntary organization. It doesn't will itself into existence, and it doesn't exist because the state has given it permission to exist. Rather, the church exists by the express authorization of Jesus. The church has a royal charter and a mandate. And if I could sum the mandate up, it would be to be a parable of the kingdom, a lived parable of the kingdom, eschatological reality in this worldly settings, a different peculiar people. And Jesus has instituted the church as a people and place to exhibit his rule on earth as it is in heaven. That's what I mean by parable. We're a lived exhibit of Jesus' rule. Now, Lehman relates the royal priesthood to Adam's vocation, to keep watch and to work the garden, as that's the place where God dwelled. Adam was the original bearer of the office priest-king. Every believer, though, possesses this same office thanks to our union with Christ. We reign with the church, with Christ and on Christ's behalf. And when we submit to Christ, we're authorized to act in his stead. The priesthood of all believers is thus a royal office. To belong to the church is to be an authorized representative of the kingdom of God. To be a royal priest is to keep watch over and to work further God's kingdom. The local church is therefore the institution that Jesus created and authorized to pronounce and to practice the gospel of the kingdom. It's an embassy representing the kingdom that speaks and acts as an official representative for Christ and his kingdom. Pentecost marks the anointing with the Spirit that typically accompanies the appointing of priests and kings. So there's an institutional and, dare I say, a political aspect to Pentecost. Because the birth of the church was the divine commissioning and authorization of an interpretive community. An interpretive community charged, mandated with proclaiming and enacting the truth of the gospel. Every believer is an ex officio member of the royal priesthood, an office bearer representing Christ with all the privileges and responsibilities appertaining thereunto. So Pentecost marks not simply the birthday of the church, but the divine authorization of an evangelical interpretive community, a community with authority that is divine appointing and divine anointing to proclaim the gospel. The church is what it is by virtue of its relation to the ascended Christ, and this independent of the particular organization you happen to be involved in. Because the church is made up of those who are already not yet seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Yes, but to leave the church in heaven is to fall prey to a descetic view. Because the church is also a local and historical entity, the earthly embassy of the heavenly kingdom. The chief difference between the universal church and the local church is that the former, the people are united in faith, 
And the latter, the people are united in faith and order. There has to be some order here on earth. So you might say the church on earth is politicized. And those who belong to the royal priesthood are members of the household of God. This household has a structure. Remember, remember that oikonomia, the Greek for economy, uh, is literally, that is etymologically, means household management. So God has a household and he knows how to manage it. So I want to look now at the project, the purpose, and the pattern of church polity. Many of us may be indifferent or even put off by the topic of church polity. I was, until fairly recently. But if the church is a society of Christ, as Calvin says, then we have to give a little bit of thought as to how to order it. And polity refers to the way of governing a society. Church polity, then, is about how Christians do their citizenship of the gospel on the ground. What does citizenship of the gospel look like on the ground? Now, even a cursory glance at the diversity of Protestant church polity, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Congregational, may well make you doubtful that there can be anything mere about it. So I harbor no illusions here of solving in a few minutes centuries-long disputes over the particulars of church government. I do, though, want to gesture towards what I'm calling mere Protestant polity, which begins by acknowledging Jesus as master of the house. The risen and ascended Christ has not abdicated but assumed his throne, remaining active and present in his spirit. And mere Protestant Christianity agrees that the first principle of church polity is acknowledging Jesus' kingly rule by his scepter, the word, and in the power of his spirit. Polity matters. It's not as important as soteriology, but it's important to order our Christian society in a way that's worthy of the gospel and conducive to its mission, making disciples. Every local church has some kind of polity, some way to constitute itself, maintain itself, make decisions. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. So the purpose of mere Protestant polity is to enable disciples to carry out, live out their royal priesthood. It matters, as I said, because we have to live out our citizenship of the gospel here on earth in some kind of order with others who are trying to do the same thing. Now, holding office authorizes office bearers to do certain things. Polity helps us to understand who is authorized to do what. Now, through union with Christ, as we've seen, believers have been incorporated into a royal priesthood, and that authorizes them to live as God's new covenant people, to image God through filial obedience, to be little Christs to one another. And the task of the royal priesthood is not to finish something that Jesus has left undone. Rather, we organize ourselves in order to attest and exhibit to Jesus' finished work. The main point is this. As a royal priesthood, every believer holds the office of martyr, in the sense of witness, one who gives authorized testimony to the meaning, truth, and freedom of the gospel. Now, the pattern of church polity. I hope it's become clear why I'm treating the church under solus Christus. The primary reason is this. Jesus Christ has chosen to assert his lordship over the world by commissioning a visible human society to represent him and his rule. So to say that we're members of a royal priesthood is to say that we hold a peculiar office. We're citizens of this new covenant kingdom. Officers of the church are responsible for administering and monitoring membership in this earthly embassy. They're overseeing the unity and the authenticity of the witness the members bear. That's an important task. So mere Protestant polity is less interested in the particulars of church government than in the basic principle of episcopate oversight. <clears throat> 
Because whatever we call them, elders, bishops, presbyters, the basic task of an overseer is to preserve the integrity of the church's witness. John Webster puts it like this. What orthodoxy is in the realm of reflection, episcopate is in the realm of practice and order, an instrument through which the church is recalled to Christianness, to the appropriateness of its action and speech, to the truth of the gospel. Back to Luther. Important as it was for him, the principle of the priesthood of all believers did not eclipse the God-ordained minister of word and sacrament. Luther finds biblical support for the idea that there is an office that is ordained by God in Titus 1, 5 through 7, where Paul directs Titus to appoint elders in every town and then goes on to call such overseers God's stewards. A steward is a particular office in a house. All believers are to minister the gospel, Luther says, but a few are called to the communal office of public teaching, which is performed on behalf of all those who are priests. And Luther thinks that what sets the pastor apart is a divine call, which the congregation recognizes and acknowledges. Luther once more, it is true that all Christians are priests, but not all are pastors. For to be a pastor, one must not only be a Christian and a priest, one must have an office and a field of work committed to him. This call and command make pastors and preachers. Um, it seems as though the main difference between the priesthood of all believers and the role of a pastor for Luther is that the latter performs his office in public. Luther's clear. It's not two different ministries, but it's two forms of the same ministry. It's an ordered ministry. Calvin focuses on the passage we heard, Ephesians 4, verses 10 to 13. The ascended Christ has appointed apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers for the work of ministry. And Calvin points out God could do as he please, but this is the way he's decided to manage his household. He's chosen human means to accomplish his purpose, partly uh, to accommodate us in our weakness, partly to test our obedience, partly to teach us humility. And the reformers themselves were somewhat flexible as to the exact form church government was to take, but they agreed that some order was necessary. They agreed that Christ instituted the basic office of overseer, and they agreed that whatever form of order was decided on, it must not be set against the royal priesthood. So the special office of the pastor teacher is to serve the royal priesthood, to help them play their roles. As one 17th century reform theology text puts it, the right of public interpretation of scripture and of adjudging the truth of interpretation in public, that right does not belong to all, but only to those who have been supplied with both the gifts and the calling to the task. So this is a crucial distinction. On the one hand, all believers have the right to read the Bible for themselves and to minister it to their brothers and sisters for edification. But this should not be confused with the Office of Public Interpretation, which is a ministerial authority. And that leads me to three, the keys of the kingdom, household security. Mirror Protestant Christianity, if this is right, is not, therefore, at the mercy of every individual interpretive whim. Because that's the question we've been pursuing since last Friday. The economy of interpretive authority. Whose say-so counts when it comes to biblical interpretation and why? We need to answer this. Let's start. After Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ, Jesus says... I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, verse 19. Now Peter here is representing the disciples, perhaps the whole royal priesthood, but he becomes the chief steward of the household of God, the person with the keys. 
There's three relevant questions here as well. What are the keys? What do keys do? And who exactly is holding the keys? Everybody agrees that keys symbolize authority and that this authority is exercised in the church. But after that, opinions diverge. On the Roman Catholic view, the keys belong to the Petrine office, the pastors of the church, the bishops, and especially the Bishop of Rome, also known as the Pope. Those who hold the keys receive them from Peter via apostolic succession, that is, those ordained to the office of priests who have the laying on of hands that goes right back to the New Testament apostles. And here, the key's function is to admit or to withhold admission to the institutional church, the storehouse of saving grace. So to loose is to exercise the power to restore a, a sinner to the institutional church and especially to the sacraments. In sharp contrast, however, the reformers view Peter as representing the apostles in general. And ap apostolicity refers to the apostles' message, not their succession. Luther understood the power of the keys as granting absolution to the penitent. He says, to bind and loose is nothing else than to proclaim and to apply the gospel. For what is it to loose if not to announce the forgiveness of sins? Luther didn't see the keys as conferring power but as communicating promise. And that's the privilege of the universal priesthood of believers. In the only other passage where Jesus mentions binding and loosing, not the keys per se, but binding and loosing, Matthew 18, he's addressing all the disciples. So Luther wants to say the whole church can bind and loose. Calvin shares Luther's concern that the Roman hierarchy had appropriated to itself something that Christ gave to the royal priesthood of believers as a whole. And Calvin says this about the papacy. They know so well how to fit their keys to any locks and doors they please that one would say that they had practiced the locksmith's art all their lives. Who said Calvin didn't have a sense of humor? But Peter's the recipient of the keys in his capacity as a spokesman for all those who confess Christ. And Calvin, like Luther, explains the keys as the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins. And that makes the person who holds the keys an ambassador of Christ. But he goes beyond Luther when he comes back to a discussion of the power of the keys later in the Institutes in the context of church discipline. The relevant text here is Matthew 18, verses 15 to 18, where Jesus mentions binding and loosing again for the second time in relation to disciplining an errant brother in order to restore him to fellowship. And again, Matthew 16 and 18 are the only two texts in the New Testament where Jesus makes explicit mention of the ecclesia. So these are interesting connections. Calvin thinks that Matthew 16 is about preaching the gospel entrusted to ministers of the word, whereas Matthew 18 is about the discipline of excommunication, which is entrusted to the whole church. So in this latter case, the keys are the basis of the church's power to make authoritative decisions and to pronounce judgments. Calvin says, for as no city or township can function without polity, so the church of God needs a spiritual polity. You know there's nothing more frustrating than losing your keys. But has Protestantism lost them? Can we retrieve them? Point C. The reformers didn't have the advantage of modern biblical scholarship. They're, they were probably unaware that Jewish rabbis routinely spoke of binding and loosing the law in the context of determining whether or not a given commandment in the Old Testament applied to such and such a situation. If they bound it, then it did apply. If they loosed it, it didn't apply. That's what the rabbis were doing with binding and loosing. But what the reformers did say about forgiving and disciplining, disciplining I think anticipates in an impressive way more recent research. But what I want particularly to retrieve from the reformers 
is what Calvin says about the keys being the basis of church jurisdiction. And I want to relate this to judgments the church makes about extending not laws, as the rabbis did, but rather gospel. Binding and loosing become a constitutive aspect of the church's mission to become a people of the gospel, a holy nation whose life indeed reflects the kingdom of God. Now, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus consistently exemplifies the right way to bind and loose the scriptures, while the scribes and Pharisees consistently exemplify the wrong way to do it. For example, Jesus binds the law prohibiting murder, murder when he says it applies to anger. He looses the law prohibiting work on the Sabbath with regard to plucking grain to satisfy one's hunger. But note, please, that loosing a law does not mean the biblical text is no longer authoritative. It simply means it's not applicable in that situation. In other words, the law is never wrong when it's rightly interpreted. So, Jesus gives this interpretive authority, the right to make judgments about what is or is not evangelical in the sense of corresponding to the gospel. He gives that right to the church. And this dominical authorization is the main thrust of Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And what immediately prompted it was the confession, the apostolic confession, you are the Christ. In Matthew 18, Jesus uh, links the judgment of the church to his ongoing presence. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. The implication is that when the church issues a judgment, that decision is to be regarded as a de declaration of the risen Christ. The keys are given to a local church where two or three are gathered. And what do they do? They open or close the door to the earthly embassy of God's kingdom. Now, I'm not saying believers need the church to be united to Christ, but her, the members of the church on earth, the body politic, they need to be either recognized or not as members, that is, authorized representatives of kingdom work. This is one of the chief purposes of baptism, by the way. One is admitted into the body of Christ. I've mentioned Jonathan Lehman. He's developed in several books an account of the church's authority to exercise the keys, to preserve the integrity of the gospel, and the integrity of the royal priesthood, the people of the gospel. In his words, here is the bottom line. See what you think. The keys of the kingdom authorize their holder to pronounce on heaven's behalf a judgment concerning the who and the what of the gospel. What is the right confession and right practice of the gospel? Who is a right confessor? Think of it as a dominical authorization to rule on what is or is not in correspondence with the gospel. The authority of the keys is the authority to assess a person's gospel words and gospel deeds and to render a judgment. So the keys, I'm suggesting, represent the authority of the local church as an interpretive community making theological judgments about the gospel. In giving the royal priesthood the keys of the kingdom, Jesus appoints the church to exercise his authority First, to proclaim and preserve the integrity of the gospel. Second, to admit those who profess faith in Christ into the local embassy. Three, to expel those whose beliefs and actions fall short of the standard of the citizenship of the gospel from the embassy. And then fourthly, to determine whether or not a doctrine or practice is commensurate with good citizenship of the gospel. Lehman then is calling our attention to the political nature of a local church, which he defines as a group of Christians who reg regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Christ and his kingdom. 
there is something institutional about the task of making good citizens of the gospel, disciples. As I say, baptism publicly identifies someone as part of the body of Christ, and then the baptism and the Lord's Supper together knit the church together, giving it an identity and form, making it visible. God's people on earth need some kind of institutional procedure to mark off who speaks for Jesus and who does not. The local church is that place where God's people, the society of Jesus, gather to do just that. All right, some theses to close. The last one will raise more questions, which will be the subject of my final lecture. First, mere Protestant local churches have the authority to make binding interpretive judgments on matters pertaining to statements of faith and the life of church members insofar as they concern the integrity of the gospel. Now this is far from being a charter for every individual interpreter to read the Bible in a way that is right in his own eyes. Rather, now it appears that the royal priesthood is an ordered and disciplined community which exists largely to proclaim and interpret scripture, to bind and loose certain interpretations of scripture and those who hold them in order to preserve the integrity of the local embassy as a parable of the kingdom of God. In other words, individuals do not have the run of God's house. And if they get too rambunctious, they may find themselves locked out, at least temporarily. Two, Christ authorizes both the congregation as a whole and its officers to minister the same word in different ways. All royal priests exercise the power of the keys, making judgments concerning the what and who of the gospel, but ordained ministers have authority to teach in public and to make recommendations to the congregation as to the right use of the keys. The suggestion then is that there's a distinction between possessing the keys and Uh, giving good examples as to how to use them, call it an advisory authority. Three, Christ authorizes the local church to be an authoritative interpretive community of the word of God. Uh, This, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but here I want to spell out the various elements in the pattern of authority uh, via the solas. So, solas Christus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. Sola Scriptura. Christ reigns over the church via his written word, which was the testimony of those whom he had delegated authority to write it up. Sola Ecclesia. The church alone and the whole church is authorized to make binding interpretive judgments about the meaning of Scripture. There's a pattern of authority there. And then fourthly, mere Protestant local churches have an obligation to read in communion with other local churches. Now, I haven't argued for this, but a moment's reflection ought to indicate why it or something like it is necessary. Matthew's gospel never asks the question, what if a local church gets it wrong? Church history is unfortunately replete with examples of churches making decisions that were later regarded, even by those churches themselves, as wrong decisions, sometimes regarding doctrine, sometimes regarding ethics. Mark Knoll has written a book called The Civil War as a Theological Crisis. The sad fact there is that both the churches in the South and the North of the United States were using scripture to defend their respective views on slavery. What happens when members of a local church don't agree with another church or uh, even amongst themselves? Remember Ann Hutchinson? Her pastor, John Coton, wrote a book entitled The Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven in 1644, maybe because of the fallout from her trial, I'm not sure. But Cotton was a Congregationalist who believed that Christ gives each local church the power to rule its own affairs. 
Each local congregation, he says, is endowed with a charter to be a body politique to Christ. And he goes on to say, again, perhaps because of his own experience, that Christ directs local churches to give heed to a communion of churches. He doesn't call them councils, but it's, a, as it were, a communion of communions. And the ruling of such a communion of communions is only advisory. He doesn't want to threaten the, the uh, direct rule of Christ of a local church. But, he says, while they are to leave the formal act of a censure to that authority which can alone execute it, placed by Christ in those churches themselves, uh, that is, the local church has the right to heed the advice. If the local church doesn't heed the advice of a larger group, then that larger group may simply withdraw their communion from the rogue local church. What's a mere Protestant Christian to do? The church does not have to work for church unity, as I've said, because Christ has already established. But what the church must do is witness visibly, as hard as it can, to the reality of Christ's finished work. He has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. He has reconciled us to God and to one another by creating a new humanity. And bearing witness to the unity we already have in Christ requires the church to make what is in Christ, in the heavenlies, visible somehow here on earth. And there are different ways to do this. Uh, one way, for example, is through the office of the bishop. That was tried in the early church. And uh, John Webster says that while the bishop doesn't establish the unity of a church, the office of the bishop can indicate the unity of the church. But there are other ways of testifying to our oneness in Christ. And in my final lecture tomorrow, I am going to tackle this ecclesial variation on the ancient problem of the one and the many under the improbable heading of Soli Deo Gloria. Thank you. We'll give Professor Van Hooser an opportunity just to catch his breath before we go to questions. I'd remind you that uh, the questions are going to be um, uh, taped, of course. Uh, when you uh, get the microphone, if you're asking a question, can you make sure you hold the microphone close to your mouth? Don't drop it down if you think the sound is not right, because we will, the audio team will work, out, work that out. Uh, and please, can you make sure that we don't have too much of a preamble before your question, and that your questions are succinct? Are you ready to go? Yes. So who would like to ask a question? James. Thanks, Professor. Uh, you mentioned O'Donovan and Desire of the Nations uh, pointing towards the church and their eschatological end, sharing that key kingly and priestly role. And you pointed to Adam as the first example of that. Uh, O'Donovan also points to Psalm 8 as an example uh, pre-church of the role that all humans were meant to have as far as being rulers under God. And I'm just wondering that as we address people who that was meant to be their end, so unbelievers who don't have the illumination of the Spirit, how does that shape our engagement with them as biblical interpreters talking to them on social issues and ethics and uh, you know the, the culture war? So in the Reformation, Christendom was still a thing now, not so much. As we seek to be biblical interpreters, the Phillips, the Ethiopian eunuchs, how does that end for them shape how we address and speak to them as interpreters of Scripture? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. How does the church as a society address broader society that should be more like the church but isn't? Um, and there are lots of options here. Uh, different things have been tried. The Constantinian solution was to make all of society like the church through political means. I don't think we're at that stage now. Um, and so I think uh, what we can do is be a contrast society. I think we bear witness by being a light to the world. We are in our community to show people, like the godless congregations, what true communities are. 
I've been struck by the philosopher Jacques Derrida, the deconstructionist, the postmodern philosopher. He was interested in religion towards the end of his life, and he mentioned forgiveness. But every time he used the word forgiveness that I heard, he always had a, a phrase that followed it, forgiveness, if such a thing for exists, if such a thing exists. He was the one who wrote a, uh, the essay on can a gift be given, or if you give a gift, are you always expecting something in return? Is grace possible is the question, if such a thing exists. The church exists to show the world that such a thing exists. It's, that's part of our creed. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, but it can't just be a message if the world doesn't see it. So I think the church is to be a peculiar people, light on the hill, city on the hill, uh, all sorts of images, and, but our words won't carry force unless our communities bear some resemblance to what we're talking about. And that's why I think we really do need to work, not only on the doctrine, but the practice of church. And when, it, when, it do, when it's done well, it's very hard to argue with a community that's functioning and loving and forgiving and, and supportive of one another. How do you argue against that? That's what the world needs. What we see today are conflicts, conflicts, conflicts. What's so sad, of course, is when the church looks like one more society. And, and I'm afraid people can point to examples of the church looking like every other society. We're to be a royal priesthood. That is our mandate. We have to look a bit different. We're not perfect. We have to say that again. That's why the forgiveness of sins is so important. It's okay if we offend one another, provided that we then go on to ask forgiveness and give forgiveness. So. I'm not sure if that's hitting exactly what you're on about, but that would be my uh, take right now. I'm not, I'm not part of the moral majority in the states trying to gain power. I don't think that's the way to do it. I think I'm actually encouraged that the church you know, may even be more of a, of, my, of a minority as nominal Christians fall away, and maybe now we'll see what the royal priesthood really looks like. Uh, thank you for this morning, Professor Alex. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the keys and the exercise of local church authority. How do we effectively open or close our local embassy when there might be three or four other similar embassies within three or four blocks where someone who we close out might go and cause problems there? Yeah, great question, and of course it's not a hypothetical. Uh, we, we all know situations like this. So I think, are you asking how practically does it work out or how theoretically should we account for this, or both? So that is the subject of tomorrow's lecture. Uh, and as I say, it's improbable because I'm dealing with the glory of God and how could we start there <laughs> and end with the glory of God. But that is that is what I want to deal with is... Um, Today we talked about churches in and of themselves. Tomorrow will be, in a sense, Catholicity part two, as it were, and how we think about church unity. I think that's the issue. So I mentioned the problem of the one and the many, and your uh, concrete scenario is exactly what I have in mind. It's, uh, and I don't think I have ideal solutions because the, the situation isn't ideal, but I will try to address it tomorrow. Thank you, Kevin, for this morning. Uh, I think it was yesterday you mentioned that you thought uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, could take precedence uh, in organising other doctrines. Uh, looking over your outline here today and opening the discussion about church, uh, it would seem that the Trinity of this ecclesiology is Father, Son and Holy Scripture. <laughs> Have you simply conflated word and spirit in uh, establishing this new ecclesiology? Um, so the easy answer would be to say that, you know, when I had to cut down from the written chapter to the oral, as usual, <laughs> guess what was... But that's, that's uh, not right. Um, <laughs> 
I'm assuming that the church is the people of God, the body of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I, I assume that, and, but sometimes it's not enough to assume it to yourself, you have to say it. And so that comment makes me think I need to say it more explicitly. I don't want to be, I, to omit the Holy Spirit is to fall prey to Bernard Ram's unabbreviated Protestant principle. So again, I'll, I'll have to look that over and just make sure that I can't be read that way again. Uh, I should have known better, but uh, you're right. I think I talked a lot about the Spirit yesterday and, and not enough, or not, a, not really today. Um, I suppose, again, it was assumed when I kept talking about union with Christ. It was the only way we're united in Christ is through the Spirit. Uh, so it's there, but I think I need to make it more explicit. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Yes, I'm just got a question on what seems to me to be a, a, a tension between, on the one hand, you're upholding the General Council of Nicaea for Trinitarian Orthodoxy, which certainly we would all agree with. On the other hand, you're saying essentially the power is in the hands of a local church and that uh, any body beyond that is purely advisory. So if that was the case, uh, Nicaea would be purely advisory to local churches. And then you're saying, so it seems to be two quite different forms of church government that you're suggesting. And then you're saying, if a local church is a rogue church, uh, you think that the other churches can withdraw their communion from it. W what are you suggesting in practical terms um, should be done with, with a rogue church? Uh, and what, what sort of, if you know, some sort of structure, it just seems to me that there's a, a tension there between upholding the Council of Nicaea, which I certainly uphold and agree with, but then putting all the authority really to the local church. Okay. Um, so, just a slight correction. I wouldn't say I put all the authority in the local church, simply because, and maybe again today it sounded that way, but when I talked yesterday, I did give tradition a fair amount of authority, but I wanted to qualify it as ministerial, derivative, it was the moon to scripture's son. So tradition, the Council of Nicaea has ministerial authority. So there's that to be said. Um, and as far as the, the rogue church, uh, I, think, I think what uh, I'll be hinting at tomorrow is that perhaps the same way that we deal with a, a sinner in a single congregation. We approach the person individually, then maybe two or three, and then maybe the whole church. Perhaps something similar could be done to a, a what I'm calling a rogue local church, that either the minister could be approached by one or two ministers from other churches, um, or maybe the whole communion of other churches. Maybe the congregation needs to be addressed somehow by a pastoral letter, I don't know. But um, yeah, there aren't, I don't have a particular polity in mind for that. It's because it's such an odd situation. Again, your situation is particular, and I, and I don't want, I would have to make sure I had local knowledge before I start giving advice. Um, <laughs> but I, I did have dinner with a former archbishop last night who did say to me that uh, there are cases where, again, in the Episcopal Church in the United States, a faithful, uh, gospel-believing Episcopal minister felt that he could not have communion with his bishop superior because of theological difference. And that is the, really the only uh, power that I'm talking about here, is the power with withdrawing communion. Um, again, the purpose in Corinthians is to do it temporarily to reestablish it, its form of discipline, but that would be the only thing I can think of other than trying to pastorally address the problem specifically by having conversations about the issue. But uh, I'm a theologian, not a bishop, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so this is a question that's come through from online. It might overlap a little bit. Uh, how is the authority of a corporate testimony of the Holy Spirit to be coordinated with the church's use of the keys, especially with respect to yesterday's discussion of the mm -hmm. wrong tradition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Good. Uh, so thank you again. It's, all, it's what uh, David was suggesting too. I think I need to make this explicit. The church, when it's exercising the power of the keys, is, um, is doing the kind of thing that was happening in the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15. That, I should have just made that apparent. It isn't simply majority makes right. Uh, I'm assuming that a local congregation is trying to discern, just as they did at the Jerusalem Council, um, what the Word of God commands and commends, and that they're doing so in a prayerful spirit uh, seeking to come to a consensus that is going to be more than the product of some eloquent human speaker. It's going to be more than a rhetorical achievement. It's going to be something that maybe will astonish them. You know, we've come to an agreement. I'm often astonished when my department at Trinity comes to an agreement, you know, and, and we, do, we do open with prayer, and I take that seriously. <laughs> Professor Van Hoos, um, I wonder if you would make some comments on the relationship between the ecclesial political power that you've been, authority that you've uh, been commenting on, um, and what you might call the secular political authority, given that all authority comes from the risen Christ. And in light of um, where you ended, uh, which seems to be local congregations moving beyond the bounds of that limited society to interact with a wider society, even if it's groups of churches together. Um, how, how do we think about secular, secular political authority? Yeah, uh, good question. It's, it's relevant. I, this is not what my lecture was about, per se, but I, it's, if I were to teach on ecclesiology, I'd have to get into this a bit more. And again, there are several models. Luther's two kingdom idea, for example. So the secular authority has one sword, the church has the other. Um, I think the, the main strategy I would have, again, is not to try to appropriate more secular power to myself or to lord it over the secular authorities. It's a priestly kingdom, but in this stage, and I think I need to just do more work on this, I think at this point I would want to talk more about a prophetic office. So the royal priesthood, I think, is good for thinking about the church's life in itself, but I think I'd have to say more about the prophetic office vis-a-vis -vis the role of the state. And certainly, I think, you know, we do have a powerful prophetic office to render, and our voice should be heard, and um, we have a, a certain power in speaking forth the truth, but uh, that witness might also occasion martyrdom. And so the term is, you know, uh, means both things because those who speak up often suffer for their witness. But I think it would be the prophetic office that I would want to underline. In previous lectures, you've offered a qualified defense of systematic theology just in passing in various places. Do you want to comment on the role of, of systematics as a control or a guide for local churches in the, yeah. the, the picture you're painting in the last part? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, always happy to talk about systematic theology and the role of local churches. My, look, I, I uh, just wrote a book uh, last year arguing that the, ver the whole purpose of doctrine is to make disciples. So systematic theology, where does it belong? It belongs in the church. It's not really a university subject per se. It, it ex all this talk about doctrine exists to help form disciples, to help them appreciate what is in Christ, and then when we do that, that helps to know how to conform to Christ. It's all about what I would say, doctrine is all about helping disciples to get real. Because reality is defined by what is in Christ. The purpose of doctrine is to conform us to Christ. So systematic theology is all about helping disciples to get real. Um, but with regard to the questions we've been t discussing today, I think uh, where systematic theology begins to play a, a role in a local church is if there's catechism involved. Uh, catechism is a kind of mini systematic theology. 
In fact, Jim Packer prefers to think of himself not as a theologian, but as a catechist. The, the commonality is that we're doctors of the church, teachers of the church. And that doctoring of the church is intended to build the body of Christ up. So I think systematic theology is absolutely vital for the health of the body of Christ. And sometimes it includes uh, antibodies and you know inoculations against false teaching. Other times it's just vitamin and sometimes depending on your pastor theologian you may have be have a church on steroids <laughs> thanks uh, you mentioned yesterday the primacy of scripture and you said like scripture was the sun and there was tradition and other things um, which were like the moon reflecting that I guess today as you talked about the authority of the local church to give binding decisions on interpretation on what is and isn't in, in line with the gospel. Um, are you afraid that you could eclipse scripture with church authority? Well, I suppose I would be afraid because as I mentioned about fundamentalism, sometimes, and it's not just the fundamentalists, but again, if you're unaware of the fact that you're interpreting, there's more of a danger that you're likely to confuse or to conflate your interpretation with the Word of God itself. I don't think the Reformers were you know, in danger of doing that. That was what they were doing. They were so conscious of the fact that the, that the Word they had rediscovered went against the tradition of the church they were involved in, and then they realized it was, you know, they had to practice what they preach and try to get their own acts together. And that's, again, what we'll be talking about tomorrow is how they tried to get the, themselves together. But yes, you want to follow up? I, I guess in what sense then is the decision of the local church binding? Like talking about keys, binding. Oh, okay. In what sense is that binding in relation to scripture? Yeah, so it's binding in so far as the local church has the authority to, to, to make its own statement of faith. And so a, a local church is going to try to base its statement of faith on scripture. It's binding for that community. They can't bind someone who doesn't belong to that community. But it's, it's my way of saying that instead of some other organization imposing a statement of faith on a local church, I think that the local church has to work out in fear and trembling and the power of the Spirit uh, its, its faith. And that exercise can be very, very helpful. And of course, it, we only say this because Christ has said he's given the Spirit to the church. If, we're, if it's right that we're a royal priesthood, uh, and if we have officers who have training, as the Reformers wanted them to do, a church should be able to articulate its faith. And it should also be open to correction from other churches that have done that. And that's will be my focus tomorrow, is how a local church needs to be open to correction. If they are taking their royal priesthood seriously, they have, remember we talked about epistemic conscientiousness. If you're really responsible as a knower, you have to grant the fact that you're not the only community trying to get this right. It would be presumptuous to think that your binding is somehow right and everybody else's is wrong. We have to do it, it's a responsibility. We can't just defer the decision. I don't know what the gospel is, I'll let you in. We can't do that. But on the other hand, we can't simply appropriate simply to ourselves as if we're the only church on earth. So it's that tension that I'm gonna to try to explore tomorrow. That sounds a good segue with which to, to finish. Would you again thank Professor Van Hoosen?